I guess it's time. I've been getting asked a lot of questions again. I avoided talking about it when it first came up, what, like a year ago, uh, because I didn't have enough information, and I don't think anyone did. But now that it's in the news again, and now that we know more, I guess it's time for me to talk about Rust. So for anybody who's been living under a rock for a few years, uh, Alec Baldwin was working on as a, both an actor and a producer on a low-budget Western that involved a lot of gunplay, and uh, during a camera rehearsal, shot a live round uh, accidentally uh, through one crew member and into another, killing her. Uh, obviously, this is tragic. Obviously, a lot of things had to go wrong with the protocol for this to happen. Uh, and information has still been coming out publicly just even in the last week as charges are filed about what the heck went wrong. And, of course, being a litigious society as we are, who's to blame? Now, here's the thing. I, I, I don't, frankly, care as much who's to blame. What I care is that we never have it happen again and that we establish protocols that, that make sure it never happens again. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Kevin Inoue, uh, Fight Designer LLC. I'm author of the Theatrical Firearms Handbook and the Screen Combat Handbook. Um, I run a couple of YouTube channels, uh, Fight Designer and a YouTube, <clears throat> which specializes in theatrical and film firearms work. Um, I have worked as an armor on small, low-budget indie action films, kind of like Rust. Uh, I have worked as a SAG after stunt performer, as well as a pre-union stunt performer. Uh, I have worked as an actor, including having guns aimed at me. Uh, I have rented out prop guns. I have used real guns. So I have a lot of folks who are asking me, like, well, what's your take on this? And, and the, the charges being pressed and things like that. So let's kind of start with uh, this idea of the charges and who's to blame. Then we're going to work through why do we even have real guns on set and what was the ammo. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what can we do going forward. So this might be a long video, but I'll try and set up... Uh, uh, YouTube's actually started adding these sort of chapter things, so you might be able to skip ahead if you want to skip any one of these sections. All right, so let's first, let's talk about blame, because that's what's in the news most right now with the charges being filed. So uh, the big question that most folks are, are debating right now is whether or not the actor is responsible for checking the firearm prop and therefore is legally liable for having caused death and injury. Mostly people who have worked with primarily real firearms and come from that world where the responsibility for safe use is on the user. Uh, that has been the mantra of the entire Second Amendment community uh, for, for at least the decade since the NRA changed into the lobbyist organization it is now. The whole uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people, personal responsibility, all that stuff. Um, and we don't want to look at you know, systemic issues because that gets into like CRT and other stuff that are boogeymen at the moment. We're going to talk about personal responsibility. So here's the thing. Actors pretend to know about things that they know nothing about all the time. That's their job, right? Uh, my last job, I was uh, as an actor, I was playing a boat captain. They did not make me pilot the boat. <laughs> they did not make me figure out how to do all this. Uh, the, the actual uh, captain of the boat was playing one of the other sort of crew people so that he could be on the boat. Um, <clears throat> a lot of actors know very little about firearms, and that's okay, because they needed to be able to focus on their job, which is the acting, and that's why we have gun wranglers. So, yes, you as an actor always have the right to ask, can I see how this is going to keep me safe? Can I ask how this is going to keep my scene partner safe? Um, but you do not necessarily, in my opinion, always have the responsibility. So, that's my hot take, and here's, here's a metaphor that might help with that. Let's say you were going to rent a car, you fly into a new town, you need to rent a car, you take the shuttle to the airport uh, rental car place, <clears throat> and they hand you the keys and they say, okay, we have it checked out, it's ready to go, it's all yours, bring it back in three days. So you pull out, go straight into the highway on-ramp, uh, accelerate to match traffic, and then someone in front of you kind of brake checks you or something or stops or, or pulls in unexpectedly, and you slam on the brakes, and they don't work. And you realize in that split second, Oh shoot, my car has no brakes, you smash into them, you cause an accident, someone is injured, someone dies. And you have everybody saying, well, why didn't you check the brakes before you pulled onto the highway? That's your job as a responsible car driver to check the brakes every time and look under the hood and make sure it works like, well, I mean, yeah, should you have? Maybe, kind of. But is it your responsibility, really? Or can you assume that when this professional company hands you the keys and says, this car is ready to go, that you assume they did their job? 
My take is it's not your job to check the brakes, check the turn signals, check the headlights every time you are handed a rental car. That's their job. And if they screw it up, that's on them. But you always have the right to be like, hang on, before I pull this out of the lot, can I like do a little inspection? Can I check and make sure that the brake, brake lights are working, that the brakes are working, the headlights work? Sure, yeah, you can do all that. <clears throat> they might be a little annoyed, but that's their problem. Your safety is more important than their annoyance. So let me give you an example. The last television acting job that I had was Mayor of Kingstown, uh, season two, episode one, uh, the, the boat thing I was telling you about. And another actor comes in and the whole scene is, the, the whole point is that he is aggressively uh, coming at me with a gun. He points an AR-15 straight at me. He's got a Glock on his hip that he doesn't pull. But this was also an interesting situation because we're on a boat, a small boat. And so the armor could not be on the same boat with us. There was just no room. So they kind of preloaded that actor with everything they might possibly need for the shot and then trusted him to be safe with it. I didn't necessarily trust him, but I'm not the gun wrangler on that set. So it's not my job to turn to that actor and say, hey, I see you getting bored and fiddling with the safety and, and clicking the trigger even. Uh, here's what you should do. Here's where it should be. Here's how to let me take that for you. That is not my place as a, a union day player on that set. What is within my rights and what worked just fine was to say, hey, uh, <clears throat> so I've seen the script uh, and, and I see the props you've got there. Are, are, the, are those real firearms? Can, I, can you show me like what's actually being aimed at me so that I know that I don't have to actually worry for my safety on this set? Uh, and the armor and the actor were like, oh, yeah, sure, cool, here you go. Um, and they were real firearms. Uh, there was no ammunition in the AR-15, but there was a dummy round in the magazine of the Glock 17. Uh, even though firearm was never pulled, I guess they just wanted to have it in case the director for some reason said, hey, can we see you rack the slide on your Glock or something? I don't know. Again, it's a little different when the armor can't be right there and take it from you between takes. Uh, because, yes, when the actor got bored between takes, he was treating it like a fidget spinner and flipping the safety on and off and even uh, dry firing the, the AR a couple of times. Not a firearms expert. Not his job. The job is for the gun wrangler to make sure that he doesn't have anything that will cause problems if he does do something stupid. I mean, part of the gun wrangler's job is to idiot-proof the set as much as possible. As a specialist, you make sure that your actors are safe. And if they're not then it's your job to disarm them to the level where they are, whether that means giving them dummy props or whatever. So that's, that's kind of my hot take on, on the responsibility of the actor versus of the armor. The armor in this particular gig was, she was young, she was relatively inexperienced. I have no doubt that she intellectually, academically, knew all the right things to do. She grew up in a family of armors. I'm sure she knew the rules. But one of the things besides inexperience that comes with being young and not having a long resume is respect and authority. And if you are not given the respect and authority and cannot take the respect and authority to look your producer and your movie star star right in the face and say, hell no, you can't do that, then you can't do your job because that's part of the job. Um, you know, I, I, when this full whole rust thing came out originally, uh, I had a lovely post from a director I'd worked with, Sam Aquino, on uh, Bullets, Blood, and a Fistful of Cash, uh, you know, paragraphs long, talking about how um, people had complained that, that I was being a little too hard-ass as Gun Wrangler on that movie. You know, his dad visited set and was like, oh, the guy won't even let me pose for pictures with it. They're not real guns. I know they're not real guns. Uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, Dad, that's his job. Uh, there were times I had to tell him no. He wanted to do uh, point blank, looking over the shoulder so can't cheat offline, shots with uh, full gauge, full 12 gauge shotgun blanks, um, multiple ones, walking down in a follow shot. And I had to say no, and he wasn't sure he believed me, so I took some uh, cardboard from craft services and blew a hole through like five sheets of cardboard with that 12 gauge blank, and he said, oh, okay, I guess you're right, we can't do that. So what can we do? Because you do have to be ready for a, a no, but. No, we can't do that, but we could try this. Directors don't want to just stop. Don't shut down the conversation. You want to be able to keep it going with some alternate proposals. Instead of this, what if we did that? We ended up using a, a flash cotton charges and an airsoft uh, shotgun set off by a party popper. It, it was kind of a little workaround that didn't do everything he wanted, because I could only do one shot at a time that way. Um, but it was safe at close range. Sometimes we have to make compromises when we're on a budget. You know, there are props that could do safe muzzle flash at close range, like the, the non-guns from ISS or something, but we didn't have the budget for that. Like, our entire firearms budget for the whole movie probably would have rented one of those for, like, two days. 
one gun for two days and that. So these things happen. So we'll talk more about the, the dummy rounds and things in a moment here. Um, but there is one other important person on set who's relevant to safety and who needs to be called out here, and that is the first AD. So the first assistant director is supposed to be in charge of the overall safety of the set. That is a very important role. And while they sure, certainly can delegate when there's pyrotechnics, when there's stunts, stuff like that, they can allow the specialists to have their say, but they need to facilitate those, those safety talks in the morning. They need to, to help empower them, not disempower them. And part of the problem was the first AD on this set. He'd already had previous complaints about him uh, from a couple years ago uh, about unsafe sets, about issues of pyrotechnics, blocking exit lanes, as well as instances of inappropriately sexual behavior in the workplace. And you put all that together, and then you put this person ranking right over a young female armor with not a lot of experience. And I can guarantee you, this was not a good mix. <laughs> um, I'm sure that he was not giving her the respect she deserved uh, for her position. Whether she deserved it as an individual or not, her position deserved that respect. They need to listen when she says no. Um, and so whether she felt just that she wasn't able to say no to those people or they didn't listen to her, I don't know. But one way or another, you've got to be able to say no. That is a very important part of the job as an armorer, as a stunt coordinator, as a fight choreographer, as an actor. If something is unsafe, you have to be able to say no. Now, the first AD did take a plea deal. Um, he not only created this unsafe set that had already had prior complaints, people had just walked off of, but he's also the individual who personally picked up a prop firearm that did not belong to him, that he had not checked, he had not loaded, handed it to Alec Baldwin right before that shot and said, cold gun on set. So he lied. He did not verify, he did not know it was a cold gun, he told the actor it was, handed it to the actor. So the actor, in this case Alec Baldwin, had every reason to believe that someone told me this is not going to go boom, I don't have to worry about it going boom. So the first AD's already taken a plea deal for that, uh, so he's not going to face any further charges, but to me that is a huge, huge safety failure, uh, just as much as that of the armor. Both of them did not do their job and actually actively undermined the safety that was supposed to be a part of their own jobs. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because Alec Baldwin is also a producer on this set, which means that he was, to some degree, involved in hiring and firing and setting budgets and agreeing to things. So he is also, I think, a little bit extra complicit in terms of the overall safe atmosphere of the set, the individuals who are present and whether or not they're listened to. And if nothing else, he had the star power to be able to make a difference. If Alec Baldwin had said, hang on, you know, that's not your job, get the armor in here, in, in here and have uh, Gutierrez hand me that prop and check it for me first, they would have had to listen to him, but he did not. And here's one of the big takeaways. If you don't have the budget to do it safely, you don't have the budget to do it at all. So several other companies already had turned down that job, saying, no, that's not a big enough budget to do the kind of gunplay you want to do. They found someone who would do it on a, on a budget. Um, that meant that the armor was also working props department, uh, and there were complaints that she was taking too much time one place or another. They were, they were haranguing her. Again, she didn't know how to tell them no. Maybe she wasn't given the respect of that position. So she was being pulled off to do other prop stuff. But... What she should have said is, sure, but I'm going to lock all of the ammunition, all of the guns up, and no one's going to touch them until I come back, and I'm back in my position as armor. And that did not happen. There's no reason that stuff should have been left just lying out for anybody who wants to to mess with. In making movies, we routinely break the, the quote-unquote four rules of firearm safety, or three rules. The NRA pared it down recently. But this idea of, like, never point a gun straight at people, come on. It's a movie. We have to. How many times do you watch an action movie where somebody is taken hostage and has a gun to their head and say, hey, you can't do that, that's unsafe? No, you don't. You watch the movie and you enjoy it and you know that they're just telling a story and you assume that they did something to keep that safe. Maybe it's a completely solid rubber gun. Maybe everybody involved personally verified to make sure that it was not loaded with anything. Maybe it's a top venting blank gun, so the only real issue is the volume. Uh, and what kind of load they put in it, but nothing's going to come out the muzzle. Maybe it's an airsoft gas blowback that's been verified so it doesn't have any BBs in it. Who knows, right? I'll tell you who, the armor. And who should know is the actors. They should know what's being stuck in their faces as well. But it's not uh, a violation of the rules of firearms on set because we have to be able to break some of those safety rules because we're telling the story of people doing unsafe things. 
We just need to make sure there's all these other safety rules in place to keep the performers safe. Um, so yes, we have our finger on the trigger sometimes when we don't need to. Yes, we sometimes aim guns straight at other characters or right at the camera or whatever. Um, yes, we sometimes aim at something that's safe, even knowing that there's something behind that that is not safe. But we do it knowing that we have a prop that is not going to make that cause problems or we have some other cheat. So yes, my finger's on the trigger, but it's a blank firing gun with a light load. They're 30 feet away, and I'm cheating four feet uh, to the left because the camera's not going to see that difference in this shot, wide shot that we're in. Or they're not even in this shot because I'm just aiming off camera, and so there's a solid wall there of, of plywood uh, in this set, and so I'm not actually aiming at anybody. You know, there's ways that we can cheat it. So for everybody who's like, well, I know the firearms rules, and they're being unsafe, and so send his ass to jail, it's different on a movie set. And unless you know movie sets, Maybe just don't pretend you know what you're talking about yet. Does that mean that on real world, you are not responsible for your own firearm safety use? No, of course you are, right? <laughs> it's just different. All right, and um, this is this video is getting long enough already. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into a part two, uh, where I talk about how this happened. So part one has been about culpability. Part two is going to be about how did this even go down on set, and what should have happened instead, and what can we do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. All right. So uh, I'll drop that in in uh, probably a couple of days. But until then, you know, if you want to know when it happens, you can click subscribe, like, comment, ask questions, whatever. And uh, you can find me at fightdesigner.com.